Hello, hello. I'm Denny Daniel, and I curate the Museum of Interesting Things. And the purpose behind the Museum of Interesting Things, it's a traveling museum. We kind of show people that their iPods didn't pop out of thin air. Came from a long line of uh, different inventions. We kind of demystify things. We show you that your, your iPods didn't pop out of thin air. They came from pretty much the inventions I've got over there. So actually, let me show you one of them. This one here, do you know what this is? Let me have a volunteer to help me out with this one. Let me... So this piece here is a Thomas Edison cylinder phonograph. Mm -hmm. That would basically be your iPod. Okay. And uh, like I said, the purpose behind the museum is to kind of demystify things, to problem solve things. So, hmm, you want to see how this works? This is a record. The records came in cylinders. These are the first records. Originally, they were made out of wax and then celluloid. This is a celluloid. And celluloid is just a fancy word for a kind of plastic. OK, so you're going to grab that and wind that like a couple of times. All right. <laughs> uh, clockwise. That should be good. And then I'm going to turn it on for you guys. Ready? Listen to this guy. Now, the only problem is I know that Aaron wants us to keep it a little quiet, so can you just find the volume on that thing real quick for me, and I'll show them a cylinder? Just find the volume. It must be there somewhere. See if you can find it. it must... Here, you know what? Let me help you out right over here. Hold on. Let me help you out right here. There you go. There is no volume. It's a horn. <laughs> I was, give her a hand. <laughs> she did a good job. Uh, I was going to have her take off her shoe and then take off a sock, but then I realized she's not wearing any socks. <laughs> and that's why sometimes when I look for a volunteer, I try to see what their foot looks like. <laughs> so go ahead and grab a seat. And if you think about it, <laughs> and you think of, if you think about it, we take it for granted that we go into our car, our parents' car if we're younger, and our car if we're older. And we just slowly, incrementally lower the volume. We take it for granted all these years that you know, we just lower the volume easily. But really, that was an invention. And invention makes me feel like you should have a P Columbia PhD. It was a problem, and somebody solved it. And that's really how, what happened to me when I first went home and brought this home. I brought this home. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I live in a doorman building in the city. And all of a sudden, I was playing this. I go, oh my god, they're going to get, you know, neighbors are going to complain. It was really loud. So I'm trying to figure out where the volume is. And I'm looking around. I go, oh my god, Edison is probably rolling in his grave right now, saying, you fool, it's a horn. And I often ask people, what do you think, you know, what do you think he did in the beginning? Put a sock in it. So we researched it. Put a sock in it, comes from the Edison horn. <laughs> yeah, I had librarians make sure that was correct just before I told you. So yes, it's good. It's correct. And the whole concept of sound, you know, they make things seem so mysterious all the time. And that's the whole purpose behind the museum. I could like just lecture people and all that, but I found out the best way to show people is to, is to actually show them. But still, people look and go, what is sound? And like I said, they make things so mysterious. It's so not mysterious. Everyone in the room is going to get it in like five seconds. Basically, when I speak to you, my tongue is just moving air. We've all heard of sound waves. All I'm doing is sending a bunch of sound waves that hit your eardrum. That's it. What does a drum do? When you hit a drum, you know what happens. Yeah, exactly. It's as simple as that. Don't let anyone convince you that something's voodoo mysterious, out of control, because it's really that simple. So when Edison figured that out, he said, wait a second. If I, you've all heard of Plato. <laughs> if I take something, and I speak, and let's say you know how Plato makes an impression, and I speak, and these, are, these originally were wax cylinders, so I'm sending sound waves, and it just hits this. So rather than using Plato, he used wax. Some people used tin. So now, when I'm, when I'm talking, the air waves 
are just hitting this. The sound waves are just hitting this. So if I play them back, shouldn't I move there the same way? When, when he realized that, he said, hey, if it's that simple, why don't I try it? So he tried it with the wax cinder, so, uh, cylinder, and boom, it worked. It's as simple as that. Don't ever let anyone make anything seem too complicated. Anyone heard of a pigeon parachute? Why would a pigeon even need a parachute? What do you think? What do you think? Why would a pigeon need a parachute? What's a pigeon need a parachute for? I've heard some really fun answers. What do you think? I know you have a good thought. No? <laughs> hmm. I'll give you a hint. This is the real deal. This is from our army, the American army. And we actually parachuted down 16,000 pigeons behind enemy lines in occupied France. This is one of the cages our soldiers actually used to help win the war. And it's basically like sending a bunch of cell phones. They used homing pigeons, carrier pigeons, simple as that. And then they parachuted them down. This was an eight pigeon cage, so there would be eight pigeons in here. And then let's say they put some sort of note that would tell the French people, tell us how many Germans they are, there are, tell, tell us where they are, it was espionage. So then they would pull out the pigeon, they would write a note, and they put that note onto the pigeon's leg, you know, carrier pigeon, homing pigeon, and then where would the pigeon fly? Would you tell them to fly to 34th Street and Broadway? <laughs> well, if it's called a homing pigeon, where do you think he goes? They make everything seem so complicated just before somebody was asking me, where do they go? I don't get it. And I'm like, they go home. They're called a homing pigeon. Every one of you, look at your foot. Good. Tonight when you go home, you taking home that foot? Good. As far as I know, Aaron's not taking feet as, you know. So basically, if I put a note on all your feet, it goes home with you. So if you're a kid in school and you get a memo, it's, you're a carrier kid, I guess. And you, could have, <laughs> and you could have carrier moose. You could have a carrier giraffe. It doesn't really matter what animal. Everything eventually goes home. And they send it home around dinner time to the, you know, so that he'll go home to the wife and kids and have food. <laughs> You know, and it's basically a simple concept. In fact, I even have the parachute to show you. Oh, well, you know, I haven't been using our little slides, and now's a good time for that. That's the parachute. Cool, huh? The best part about getting this parachute was that it said, with eight bird container, and I had the container. <laughs> I was like, OK, that's cool. And I actually, when I do this, I'll pass these things into the audience and let people you know, touch it. In fact, why not? Here you go. And pass it around. How many times are you going to touch a World War II uh, parachute? Oh, wait. You're missing something. Where's the note? I have actually, not the note. The, but I have the, the thing that the note went in. So that's the capsule that's in my hand right now. And these, you see the one on top is open. You would unscrew it, and you'd put a note inside that on a pigeon. We sent 16,000 pigeons uh, to the French, and about 1,800 showed, showed up and had uh, messages that helped us win the war. And these are the actual ones. How cool is that? When you're done with it, just uh, bring it up to stage to the producers. How many times are you going to get a chance to touch that? So I got a question for you guys. Have you ever heard of a magic lantern? No. 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 This is a magic lantern. And these have been around for about over 400 years. So late 1500s, early 1600s, they had magic lanterns, and basically you would put you know, a candle, uh, an oil lamp. Uh, some of the later ones were electric. You could use gas powered, whatever it is that you would use for light. But back then, it would be you know, an oil lamp or a, um, or a candle. And basically, a storyteller or a charlatan would come to your town, and he would get a glass slide or a mica slide. or the, Some of these were also postcard uh, ones. But 
for back then, you would have to have something that would be clear. And then they would use the candle and project it onto the wall. And on that slide, they would paint pictures of, let's say, a monster, a dragon, your grandma. <laughs> and then they'd project, it, they'd project it onto the wall of a tent somewhere or wherever they were going to be, but you know, you'd have to have a back wall. And people would run, get into the tent and be like, oh my god, it's a monster. It's a dragon. It's my grandma. And they'd run out of the tent screaming and yelling. And that's actually how it got its name, the Magic Lantern. Because back then, that was magical to them. No one had ever seen an image projected onto something. They didn't know what that was like. It was mysterious. And that's the point behind this. Don't let things be mysterious. Don't let things be magical to you. Don't let, don't let them convince you that, you know, that you know, something is too complicated for you to understand. Clearly, none of you would fall for this today, correct? Hmm. Well, I do a talk at NYU every semester. And the professor called me up one time. He was on Houston Street. And he was, uh, he was projecting a giant image onto the wall on Houston Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. And he was using a giant, like, 2,000 lumen projector to do this. It was a giant gorilla in a spacesuit going slow motion. And, you know, I showed up with my, my, my little magic lantern. So that would be like an oil lamp, or they put a candle. And there it is inside there. So I was showing it to the professor. And like I said, there was a giant image there. A couple walks by, and the girl looks at it, and she goes, oh, are you using that to make that image onto the wall over there? So I look at the professor. He looks at me, and we're like, uh, yeah, yeah. We're using this to do that giant gorilla over there on the wall. And let me show you. This is technology from 500 years, 400 years ago, and it's using you know, a candle to make it happen. She's going, wow. And then uh, you know, I'm aiming at her belly while I'm telling her this. <laughs> you know? And she's still looking at it going, this is incredible. And I said, that finally, I, I, I said, she's probably she, she uh, realized this. So I said, um, actually, I'm not using this. I'm, you know, we have a giant 2,000 lumen projector behind me that's actually doing this image. She goes, oh, and her boy boyfriend was also, oh, oh, OK, silly me. And we filmed this, by the way. So if you don't believe me, we have footage of it. And, and he's like, oh, oh. And then uh, I realized. You know, P.T. Barnum said that a sucker is born, was it, every minute? So clearly, I'd found two of them <laughs> in that spot. So don't let anything ever become mysterious to you. Don't let anything become voodoo to you. Because if it becomes mysterious to you, then it becomes the pyramids. And if in 500 years, all of a sudden, we won't know how to fix our cell phones. We won't know how to fix our cars. We won't know anything. So everything's much simpler than they make it out to be. Thanks.